From Brennan to the Boca Chill, from Lamy to La Push, and from the lordly Sawduck to lovely Duckabush, from Samish to Sammamish, Suquamish to Quillacine. The climate is so friendly, it's a land that's evergreen. Hello, and welcome to the History of the Evergreen State podcast. I'm your host, John C., and thank you for joining me today for episode 41, The Battle of Seattle. Archaeologists believe that today's Native Americans arrived in North America over a land bridge connecting Siberia and Alaska, which was exposed during the previous ice age due to decreasing sea levels. As the glaciers receded, the Puget Sound tribes arrived 11 or 12,000 years ago. The U.S. military was the last to arrive in what would eventually become the Evergreen State. The newly founded Washington Territory's first governor was named Isaac Stevens. The governorship was not his sole title, however. The territory also required assistance with its Native American contacts, and as a result of this, Stevens was also in charge of these interactions as the Superintendent of Indian Affairs. The military of the United States of America signed numerous treaties with Native Americans. The tribes reluctantly agreed to surrender their land in exchange for fishing rights, money, provisions, and land that would be off-limits to white settlers. Several small clashes escalated into a war between the troops and the Native Americans in Seattle. The first true fight between the two forces took place here in early 1856. Between 1855 and 1858, the United States and the Yakima tribe engaged in the conflict known as the Yakima War. Governor Stevens dispatched Andrew Bolon, an agent for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, to the Yakima tribe. During the summer of 1855, Bolon spent time getting to know the tribal elders and learning about the region. Many Native Americans thought the white settlers' monitoring was demeaning and unwarranted. Despite their dissatisfaction with the treaties given, they agreed that there would be no war unless they were attacked. Gold was soon discovered in the Yakima territory, which provoked a rush of prospectors. This would simply add to the already high level of anxiety felt across the region. The prospectors crammed and encroached on the Yakima tribe's territory, which irritated its leader, Kamayakin. Despite this, the tribal chief remained by his promise to repel an attack. When the prospectors began terrorizing the tribal men and women, keeping this commitment became increasingly difficult for them. One of the terrorized women was Chief Taea's crippled daughter. Qualchan, Kamayakin's nephew, prepared an attack after learning about a group of prospectors who had been abusing and raping women, including Chief Taea's daughter. They ambushed and killed six miners as they entered the Yakima River. Bolon was informed of the murders and promptly left his station to investigate. When Shumaway, Kamayakin's brother, arrived in the area, he persuaded his companion to turn back since Qualchan was a significant threat. Bolon chose to leave the area after listening to the wise leader's advice. He wouldn't get far before happening upon Shumaway's son Moshiel and a group of tribal members who were on their way to the falls to collect dried salmon. The story has become a little muddled over the years, and no one knows what prompted Moshiel to take such drastic measures against Bolon. Some speculate that Moshiel was enraged by Bolon's role in the execution of a relative during a previous war and sought vengeance. Others claim he was envious of Qualchan's celebrity status after killing six white prospectors. According to the final account, he knew Bolon would return to the white settlers with word of the killings and that delaying his return would cause the impending battle to be delayed as well. Moshiel began persuading the other tribal members to assist him in killing Bolon for whatever cause. They were able to plan Bolon's execution while he rode peacefully behind them on the trail because they were chatting in a dialect that Bolon did not understand. The tribe members sprung into action while they sat by a creek and warmed themselves over a small fire, grabbing Bolon from behind. Bolon screamed in Chinook, the only dialect that he could speak, but that didn't stop Moshiel from murdering him without hesitation. They buried his body and abandoned him. When Moshiel returned, he would face his father's anger and wrath. When Shumaway learned of Bolon's death, he met with the other chiefs and proposed that all of the killers, including his own son, be handed over to the white settlers. The other chiefs were adamant in their refusal. Shumaway dispatched a woman to inform his soldiers at the camp about Bolon's death. The Yakima War began as a result of the military's response. The war was a one-sided affair at best. Kamayakin, the Yakima chief, led a force of over 300 warriors. Only 84 people were in the military's initial presence in the area. After that first initial battle, there were few losses on either side. The Native Americans only lost three people. Two were slain and another was kidnapped. A further four natives were hurt in the skirmish. 
Four people were killed and 17 others were injured, according to the U.S. military. The military would return to the area with 700 troops after a brief withdrawal to confront the Yakima tribe. The Native Americans were quickly encircled and Qualchan would be killed in the chaos. Moshiel was shot as he attempted to flee. This prompted two more conflicts that reverberated throughout the Seattle area and the Evergreen State as a whole. The Puget Sound War was an armed conflict between the military and Native Americans that took place between 1855 and 1856. On the 26th of January, 1856, Native Americans attempted to invade the city of Seattle, resulting in the Battle of Seattle. Keep in mind, this is not to be confused with the WTO riots 130 plus years later, but that's a little too current for my taste to cover on this podcast. Maybe someday. The Treaty of Medicine Creek was the catalyst for the Puget Sound War, which began over land rights, Nisqually, Puyallup, Stillicum, Squaskin, Sahomamish, Stechas, Topekskin, and Sahewasmish were among nine Native American tribes who worked together to oppose white settlers and the military. Governor Isaac Stevens, chiefs, headsmen, and delegate tribes signed the Treaty of Medicine Creek on the 26th of December, 1854. A lone Douglas fir tree provided the backdrop for the signing at McAllister Creek. The treaty tree was named after this momentous event. The treaty gave the U.S. 2.24 million acres of land in exchange for three reservations, monetary payments spread out over a 20-year period, and fishing and hunting privileges. The Native American representatives took this raw deal into mind, and rather quickly, many other tribal members from the various tribes became pissed off that so much had been surrendered for such little in return. The Nisqually tribe's chief Leshai was picked to meet with Stevens to negotiate the treaty's contents. Leshai believed that the pact would deprive Native Americans of numerous acres of valuable farming land. Leshai chose to go to battle and fight for the natives' rights because he was outraged by the unjust deal that they were being offered. Historians believe that Leshai refused to sign the contract, while others believe his signature was faked with an X or that he was coerced into signing it. In October of 1855, the battle began. Chief Leshai went to Olympia to dispute the treaty's conditions. The interim governor ordered Leshai and his brother to be tracked down and apprehended as soon as he left the governor's office. Leshai was appointed war chief, placed in command of a force of nearly 300 warriors, and led them on short expeditions against white settlers. Two military soldiers, Joseph Miller and Abram Benton, were slain early in the ensuing fights. The assassination of U.S. soldiers by Native Americans was a serious matter across the Washington Territory. Leshai was eventually found guilty of murder regardless of whether it was he himself or other members of his tribe that killed the military personnel. Governor Stevens dispatched troops to track down Leshai and demand that he be returned to Olympia. In November of 1856, troops apprehended Chief Leshai. His brother would surrender a day later, but would be assassinated by an unidentified assailant. Leshai would face a murder trial and would plead not guilty. The court stated during the first trial that killing an enemy soldier during war was not murder. This perplexed the jurors, resulting in a hung jury. The Nisqually chief faced a harsher punishment in the second trial, as the jury was not told of the wartime regulation. Chief Leshai was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death by the jury. Leshai's supporters, outraged by the decision, continued to swell in number. An army soldier defended the leader in two essays published in the press. Ezra Meeker, the founder of Puyallup, was among one of the jurors who voted for acquittal in the first trial. Despite the protests of both white settlers and Native Americans, Leshai was set to be hanged on the 22nd of January, 1858. The Pierce County Sheriff, George Williams, permitted himself to be arrested rather than carry out the execution, which caused a small delay. Gallows were thrown together in a little valley near Lake Stillicum on land that was part of the then-active Fort Stillicum, which today is part of the grounds of Western State Hospital. On the 19th of February, 1858, Chief Leshai was hanged by a noose until the life power was removed from his body. Chief Leshai's case was reopened in 2004 with the goal of proving his innocence. Leshai was falsely convicted and executed according to resolutions passed by both houses of the state legislature. His conviction would eventually be overturned as well. The historical courts exonerated him by a unanimous vote. The hearings in 2004 would be far too late, though. And while the conflict was still raging, Native Americans went on to launch an attack on the city of Seattle on the 26th of January, 1856. The settlers lost only two persons, but the Native Americans lost roughly 28 people and over 80 were said to be wounded, though exact numbers are unknown, and depending on the source, the numbers vary quite wildly, some even placing the number of Native American casualties nearer to 100. The Battle of Seattle would be over in a single day. 
Before the war, local Native American operatives, including Doc Maynard, relocated nearly 400 Native Americans from Seattle. The Decatur, a war sloop, was used by the U.S. military to position itself. The conflict began with the Decatur's guns firing on a home belonging to Tom Pepper on the forested peak of First Hill after a long and patient wait. The bombardment from the Decatur's cannons began at around 8.30 a.m. The bombardment from the Decatur's cannons began at around 8.30 a.m. since it was suspected that this home was housing hostiles. As the battle began, settlers from Seattle and earlier prior attacks in southern King County gathered in two blockhouses that had been constructed in the event of fighting, and a contingent of Marines were stationed shoreside. The locals were kept at a safe distance by the shooting, but they returned fire. When the natives stopped for lunch, the white settlers took advantage of the opportunity to evacuate women and children aboard the Decatur. When the settlers attempted to grab their guns from their abandoned homes, however, the shooting began again. This continued until roughly 10 p.m. when all firing ceased. The settlers awoke the next morning to find their attackers, as well as their food and other supplies, vanished. The number of Native Americans that were slain differs depending on who you ask. In Seattle, there were no Native remains discovered. Afterward, settlers constructed two five-foot-high fences 18 inches apart using lumber from Yesler's factory. The fences were 3,600 feet apart. The space between the fences was completely covered in dirt. The protective stockade around Seattle was completed in just three weeks. In addition to this stockade, another blockhouse would also be constructed, bringing up the total number of blockhouses in Seattle to three. To clear up the line of fire and to make spotting potential threats much easier, stumps and vegetation were cleared up around the stockade and the blockhouses. The residents were clearly shaken by these recent events, but they pledged to defend their fledgling city. Milton G. Holgate and Christian White were killed, according to local historian Clarence Bagley, who cited William Bell two days after the occurrence. The second man killed, according to T.S. Phelps, 17 years after the event, however, was Robert Wilson, who was considered to be a stranger in the young city where everyone knew everyone else. No other information is given about Robert Wilson given his status in the community, though. According to settlers, 200 to 500 natives had entered the field against the settlers, which was backed up in a letter written by Isaac Stevens to officials in Washington, D.C. T.S. Phelps, the Decatur's navigator, estimated the hostile force to be around 2,000 men, but frontier military officials frequently exaggerated the size of opposing armies to boost their own achievements, or more likely to minimize their own failures and ineptitude. Several invoices of these frightful trophies were collected and dispatched to Olympia throughout the month of February of 1856, historian Clarence Begley wrote. A Snoqualmie chief placed a bounty for the heads of those who assaulted Seattle, $80 for a chief and $20 per warrior. Governor Stevens ordered the court-martial of about 20 natives who were accused of being involved in the attack, but evidence revealed that they were engaged in legal fighting, thus they were released. Snoqualmie Chief Leshai and Klickitat Yakima Chief Oai, both of whom were eventually captured, were blamed by Territorial Governor Isaac Stevens and others for the attack. During the ensuing Coeur d'Alene War, Oai was caught and killed by troops that were headed by Colonel George Wright. Leshai escaped detection for a time, thanks to the settlers' unwillingness to cooperate, believing he had been unfairly accused of other murders. Prior to Leshai being hung at Fort Stillicum in 1858, a year-long defense was made, which interestingly included arguments from Bing Crosby's grandfather, H.R. Crosby. Kitsap of the Muckleshoot and Suquamish was also named as an instigator of the violence by Governor Stevens, but the settlers disagreed. Settlers of the new county on the west side of Puget Sound went on to name their new county Kitsap after the respected Native American chief and kind of a small F.U. to the territorial governor. U.S. Army officers were only reluctantly accepted by the territorial volunteers. Lieutenant Arthur Denny of Company A declined to send soldiers to Fort Stillicum, arguing that the company was only meant for local defense. He was demoted from his position of command as a result of his honorable yet insubordinate action. The volunteer company filed a written protest of his dismissal, and all troops of the company were denied an honorable discharge due to this. Only the territorial legislature could overturn this decision, and they did not. Although settlers in present-day King County were never attacked again, the Battle of Seattle shattered many pioneers' faith. Dr. David Doc Maynard, who helped put Seattle on the map and served as King County's Indian sub-agent, surrendered his claim to present-day Pioneer Square for Charles Terry's West Seattle properties in 1857, forgoing a potential real estate fortune in return for a transient sense of security. 
The winter after the war ended was a season of pinching want and extreme privation such as was never experienced here save in the winter of 1852-53, Arthur Denny wrote. Those who stayed until the end of the war were so dejected and afraid of another outbreak that they refused to return to their homes in the country and begin the process of rebuilding. As a result, it took years before we regained any of our lost ground. With the amount of material shot by the Decatur now strewn across the settlement and adjacent forests, cannonballs, and other relics found in and around downtown shortly after the Battle of Seattle and for the next two decades may not have counted as news, though today it surely would have. Indeed, Clarence Bagley wrote in 1920 that it was not uncommon to locate a cannonball or a shell in the woods in what is now Seattle's business district in the old days. Thus, the first newspaper description of such a discovery does not appear until 1890, more than 30 years after the one-day battle came to an end. On the 20th of August, 1890, laborers digging for Dexter Horton's new bank building at the corner of 2nd and Cherry discovered a 12-pound cannonball, according to the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. It must have been solid, because otherwise, I don't understand how it survived the intense heat that the Great Seattle Fire generated just the previous year, and was the reason why a new bank building was even being constructed in the first place. This cannonball was picked up by Darius Horton, the nephew of bank founder Dexter Horton. But you may be wondering, where in the hell did this cannonball end up all these years later? Well, it's actually pretty unclear, but what is known is that a cannonball with a very similar weight and description was donated to the Museum of History and Industry by an executive of Seafirst Bank back in 1961 and remains in the collections of Mohai today some 60 plus years later. Gilbert W. Hapgood, a Seattle homeowner, was digging a post hole in his yard near the corner of 7th and Seneca, which is now under Interstate 5, in October of 1891. He discovered a ball similar to that which is attached to a chain shot two feet below the surface. Hapgood was able to confirm that this was actually a relic of the Battle of Seattle by having Henry Yesler, who built the mill on the waterfront in 1853, reportedly validate it. What happened to this particular cannonball? It was reported that Mr. Hapgood hoped to preserve the cannonball and put it in an old oak cabinet. He was also quoted saying that he hoped to bring it to the World's Fair as a memento of Seattle's pioneer dangers. It's uncertain whether Mr. Hapgood carried out his plans, and the exact location of this cannonball is unknown today. Workers building the Great Northern Tunnel under downtown Seattle discovered a 6-inch diameter, 32-pound cannonball on Main Street between 3rd and 4th Avenue in September of 1905. According to the Seattle Times, this area was 500 feet west of the stockade, where many Seattle citizens were seeking refuge at the time of the battle. Local historian Edmund S. Meany authenticated this artifact before taking ownership of it for the museum at the State University. So whatever happened to it? The Burke Institution of Natural History and Culture is the new name for that museum at the University of Washington. It is reported that they donated their one and only cannonball to the Museum of History and Industry in 1980, and Mohai confirmed that it is still in their collections, though it is currently not on display. Workers from the Seattle Engineering Department later discovered a 3-inch diameter, 4-pound cannonball that could have been chain shot. It was discovered on 12th Avenue South on Beacon Hill near Judkins Street. Clarence Bagley, local historian and author, was contacted by the Engineering Department for this particular discovery. He stated unequivocally that this was a Decatur relic. Dexter Horton had discovered a similar relic at 3rd Avenue and Columbia Street in the late 1850s or early 1860s, according to Bagley. Horton had placed the thing near a fire and it exploded. Bagley said Horton was showered by wood and dirt, but thankfully not hurt. Bagley also told the media about his own cannonball discovery that occurred in downtown Seattle. You see, I was chopping wood near 2nd Avenue and Madison Street in 1865 when the bit of my axe struck a cannonball buried in a log similar to the one found the other day, Bagley recalled. After that, I found a few of them and used them as dumbbells, he explained. Must have been some pretty badass dumbbells and quite the conversation pieces as well. So what exactly happened to these awesome relics? These cannonballs' whereabouts are actually unknown and Clarence Begley's dumbbells are in the exact same boat. The late Sophie Fry Bass donated one of the Museum of History and Industry's five cannonballs in 1952. Bass is the granddaughter of Seattle pioneer Arthur Denny and the author of the classic Pigtail Days in Old Seattle. The author of a feature of Arthur Denny published on the 2nd of January 1891 by the Washington Standard and Olympia details the interior of Denny's residence on Seattle's Front Street, which is now known as First Avenue. 
The source adds that Arthur Denny had a large grape shot and a cannonball reminiscent of the early Indian conflicts on display in the Holmes Library. So whatever happened to it, nobody knows and probably never will. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a 5-star review and don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss a new episode. Sources for this episode include Murder and Mayhem in Seattle by Teresa Nordheim, Native Americans Attack Seattle on January 26, 1856 by Walt Crowley and David Wilma at HistoryLink, LegendsofAmerica.com, History of King County, Washington by Clarence Bagley, 1929, Skid Road, an informal portrait of Seattle by Murray Morgan, History of the State of Washington by Edmund S. Meany, Who Was Who in Native American History by Carl Waldman, 1990, History of Seattle by Clarence Bagley, 1916, The Seattle Times, and The Linden Tribune. Thank you for listening to Episode 41, The Battle of Seattle. Episode 42 will be released next week. A special thanks goes out to Al Hirsch for providing the music for the podcast. If you have any questions about the show, please contact History of the Evergreen State Pod at gmail.com. Thank you once again for listening to another episode of the History of the Evergreen State Podcast. And until next time, I'm your host, John C. Stay safe out there, everyone. There's peace on the Skokomish, on the Queets, and on the Hull. There's calm on the Nisqually, born of ageless ice and snow. A land that nature loves so much, she stays the whole year round. I trade a royal palace for a shack on Puget Sound. There's Chimicum and Stillicum, where spouts the gooey duck, the singing Stillaguamish and the swirling Skookum Chuck, and Moclips and Copalis, where the razor clams abound. A little bit of heaven is a shack on Puget Sound. A little bit of heaven is a shack on Puget Sound.